Hi everyone. So I wanted to make a video today for people who have maybe been in a narcissistic relationship or been exposed to narcissistic abuse and you may have taken it to a pastor or someone in the church, um, to church leadership, um, or even maybe to a Christian counselor, um, and you were looking for help, and instead of finding that maybe you were uh, re-victimized, or maybe instead of finding relief, um, you found that heavier burdens were placed on your shoulders because um, things were turned around on you, um, and you were told uh, that you were unloving or you were unforgiving or maybe you needed to be a better wife or a better husband um, and you were told to just continue to tolerate or to go back into an abusive situation or maybe you know the counselors or those in the church um, took the narcissist side or the abuser side and believed them and just, you know, led to even further gaslighting for you and um, made things even more confusing for you or harder for you. And so I wanted to make a video about that and, you know, just talk a little about why that's happening and what we can do about it. And the first thing I wanted to say is that um, you may have heard of um, narcissism um, compared to the Jezebel spirit. And um, Jezebel is found in a couple places in the Bible. Um, one is 1 Kings chapter 16 through 19. That's kind of where she's introduced. Um, but Jezebel was the daughter of a uh, uh, Sidonian king, and she married the king of Israel, who was Ahab, King Ahab, and um, she brought Baal worship um, into the kingdom, and um, King Ahab started worshiping Baal and Asherah, um, and um, she was pretty wicked, um, so she did a lot of evil things. Um, she was covert and just killed people on the sly murdered people. She tried to kill all of the true prophets of God. Um, she tried to take out Elijah. Um, and so she um, is mentioned there and talked about there. And then also in Revelations. Um, so Revelations 2 verse 20 talks about Jezebel. Um, it's where Jesus is talking to the church and Jesus says, nevertheless, I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophet. By her teaching, she misleads my servants. And so, you know, that spirit in Jezebel tries to mislead the servants of God. Um, but you may have heard too, if you've um, listened to teachings on the Jezebel spirit, um, that the spirit of Jezebel um, is allowed to operate where there's an Ahab. So Jezebel basically needs an Ahab to operate. Um, so Jezebel was able to come in and do all the damage she did in the kingdom of Israel because Ahab tolerated it and allowed it. And she influenced Ahab. And um, he didn't stand up to that evil um, but instead he was complacent. And so an Ahab is basically um, a person who is complacent with evil, um, a person who refuses to confront it, a person who tolerates it and allows evil to go on um, and allows it to, to continue and to wreak havoc. And so there's a lot of this that's going on, unfortunately, in the church today. Um, where the church has started really allowing a lot of evil. Um, and a lot of it is just really, um, instead of um, the church being courageous and standing up to evil as it's meant to, um, that the church is, is just 
under a more cowardly type spirit um, that that tolerates evil and refuses to stand up to it, but it's also masked um, as a spirit, as kindness even, or being a spiritual person. So sometimes evil is being tolerated under a disguise of kindness, um, of being a good Christian, of being forgiving, of being loving. Um, so we just allow people um, in the church to continue doing evil things. And we think the loving thing to do is to give them unconditional love and acceptance and um, don't realize that by doing that and tolerating that evil, um, that's not, that's, not uh, refusing to confront evil is not a victimless crime because when we refuse to confront it, for example, if we refuse to confront an abuser, it allows that abuser to continue to victimize people. Um, and there's nothing kind or loving about that, about tolerating that and tolerating someone who's treating other people that way. Um, but sometimes we, in the church, um, have given more love and acceptance to the abusers than we have to the victims of the abuse um, who are being harmed, greatly harmed. Um, and there's many situations um, where someone who has been in an abusive type situation or maybe just there's been... Um, things that they have brought to the church and where instead of the church siding um, with the victim, um, they take the side of the perpetrator and they make, they, they place the burden on the victim to forgive and they just allow this to continue. And there's a lot of evil that happens because of it. I mean, it, you can think of like a, um, you know, we we may think we're being forgiving by allowing a child molester in the church. Um, oh, we're just going to embrace and love and accept this person who um, has done these things. Um, and so we're going to allow them in our church. But there's nothing loving about allowing um, someone in the church who is harming others and molesting children. And it's the same thing as like um, a woman who um, allows a man in her life out of love for that man um, to stay in her life and to abuse her children. There's nothing truly loving about that because true love is going to stand up to that and confront that and protect the people who would be harmed. That's true love. And that's what we're meant to do in the church. Um, there's another reason why um, I think we've kind of lost sight of that. Um, and why some of these things are allowed to go on in the church. Um, and that comes from a, a lot of um, secular humanism and the ideas and philosophies of secular humanism have uh, come into the church and affected the church and infiltrated the church. And if you don't know much about secular humanism, um, I definitely would recommend doing a little research and looking it up because it has had a tremendous impact on the ideas floating around in the modern church today. Um, and a lot of it is rooted in Eastern philosophy and a lot of it is rooted in psychology. And um, so basically there's this idea and this comes straight from secular humanism, guys. Um, but there's this idea that everyone, people are really good inside and that if they're doing things that are wrong, it's because of they didn't get the love that they needed in childhood 
or um, because of the way that they were treated by their parents. And now if we just love them enough, then that's gonna turn everything around and just by pouring out more and more love on them and unconditional regard and unconditional acceptance of them, then that's gonna change their heart and they're gonna you know, come around and all of a sudden they're gonna be a good person and we can all hold hands and skip down the street together and everything's gonna be okay. That comes from secular humanism and psychology and all of that. I mean, that philosophy and a lot of that has crept into the church. And a lot of that is directly opposed to true Christian philosophy. Because true Christian philosophy says, um, yes, we were created good, but because of sin, um, we fell from that state. And now we all inherit a sinful nature. And that that sinful nature has to be put to death. Um, and that that only can be done through the blood sacrifice of Jesus Christ, um, through Jesus Christ spilling his blood and being the sacrifice for us to be redeemed into right relationship with God. And that rather than our sin being loved into making us good, we're not loved into making us good. It's it's by blood sacrifice that we're made right with God. And, you know, he made a way to do that because he loved us. Um, but this is important because this idea creeping into the church is part of why um, people are told to go back to their abusers and why people are are um, just told to keep loving them and pouring out more and more love. You just need to be more loving. You need to be more forgiving. Um, so someone who comes to the church and is in a, an abusive relationship is told, just be more loving, be a better wife, be a better husband, lay down your life, be more forgiving, and, and that will bring them around. Um, oh, that's not always the case. That's not, not always the case. And so oftentimes people are sent back into an abusive situation and just continue um, to believe that they can love this person into not abusing them anymore. And that's very unfortunate. And, um, but I mean, that, that plays a role into why these things are happening in the church because of that type of philosophy and not truly understanding what forgiveness is. And not truly under, because with secular humanism, there's not even a concept really of evil. Um, there's not a, not really a concept of good and evil. I mean, that's why um, that song, Imagine, um, by John Lennon says, um, imagine there's no heaven, it's easy if you try. No hell below us, above us only sky. Imagine all the people living for today. Um, that's that that type of philosophy. It does not recognize evil. And in that world where you don't realize or recognize that evil exists and you think people just need more love and everything's going to be okay, then the only way you can forgive is to either minimize the wrongs that other people do. Um, so you can minimize what they do. Um, you can say, well, I do that too. We all do those things. So what they did wasn't really that bad after all. Or you can make excuses for what they do and you can say, well, you know, this person um, is, you know, sexually abused people because of their childhood. They had a hard childhood. They were abused. They went through this as children. So you're basically just making excuses um, for why people are doing evil because you because with secular humanism there's not a true concept of sin or evil and a lot of that has crept into the church you'll see that when people talk about forgiveness um, um, you know uh, Christianity never overlooks or minimizes or excuses sin or evil. Um, you know, Jesus said, if you're, 
hand causes you to sin, cut it off. You know, he, he was not light on sin. Um, he was not light on sin. He said, you know, remove it. Um, and so it's, it's the same thing with God. God didn't look at us and excuse our sin and say, what you've done isn't that bad. God said, what you've done is worthy of death. It's worthy of death, but because of my love, I'll make a way for us to be reconciled and redeem you. But it's important to know because as Christians and as the true church, it's never our, our role to minimize evil. Um, we don't sweep things under the rug. We don't act like it's just okay. We confront evil. We expose evil in the church. That's that's part of what you know we're to do in the church is to confront and expose evil. And I wanted to make a, a third and final point about um, some of the issues that are at play. Um, and the, the stuff going on in the church and abuse being allowed um, and victims made out to be like the perpetrators and perpetrators made out to be like victims. Um, you know, the true church um, is walking under by the Holy Spirit, by the spirit of truth. And two of the gifts of the spirit our discernment. Um, so the Bible says that discernment um, is a gift of the Spirit. That knowledge is a gift of the Spirit and that discernment is a gift of the Spirit. And that's important because if we're truly walking in the spirit of truth and the power of the Holy Spirit, then we will have um, supernatural knowledge and discernment, and we'll be able to discern some of these things. We'll be able to see some of these things. So a church that is walking in the spirit of truth um, will be able to identify and recognize um, when a wolf is trying to come in amongst the sheep. Um, they'll be able to eventually sniff that out. And, you know, honestly, uh, an, uh, an abuser or someone who is doing those things should be afraid to step into the church. Um, if an abuser feels more safe in the church than outside of it, then that's a problem. That's a problem. That shows that we're not operating as we're meant to as the church. Because an abuser should be afraid to step into a church because that's the place where they should be most afraid to be exposed. Because if there are people who are hearing from the Lord and operating in knowledge and discernment and wisdom, they should be able to see and expose evil. And that church should be a place that an abuser is highly uncomfortable. You know, it should make them shift in their seat because they know that the spirit of the Lord is there and the Lord sees and knows these things. And if you're in a church or underneath leadership where evil is just allowed to run rampant and where it's a place where an abuser or someone who <clears throat> is a perpetrator or doing these things feels safe and can hide, then that may not be a safe place for you. And you may need to, you know, question a little, um, am I underneath the right authority? Am I underneath the right leadership? If I cannot trust you know, that's the role of a pastor. Like a pastor protects his sheep from those who would try to come in and lead them astray and harm them. A true pastor does that and, you know, is watching out for his sheep and protects his sheep. And if you're in a church where you doubt that your leadership would be able to do that for you, um, where you doubt that your leadership would be able to recognize um a manipulator, recognize a narcissist, recognize someone who is trying to pull the wool over everyone's eyes and trying to disguise themselves, you know, 
if they if they can't recognize when there's a wolf wearing a, a sheep's clothing, um, that's a problem, and that's a sign that you know this might not be a safe place for you to be because we need to be in a church where we know um, that our leaders um, are watching watching for those things and protecting us and can help us um, help be a spiritual covering to us where evil is kept out. We need to be in a church where evil is kept out. And if we're in a church where evil is just allowed to, to run free and the sheep aren't protected, then that's an issue. Um, and if that's you, I, I pray you would be able to find that, you know, because we all need that safe place um, to, to be able to grow and um, it's, it's such a, such a blessing. And, you know, I say a lot of these things, not because I'm against the church, but because I love the church and I believe in the church and I'm honored to be a part of it. And I believe that the true church, um, is a light shining in darkness and has true power walking on this earth. And, um, I love it and I honor it and I want to see the church, um, operating as it, as it's meant to. Um, you know, um, Jesus said he came to bind up the brokenhearted and, you know, we're, we're as a church, we were meant to help people who have been abused. We're meant to embrace them. We're meant to stand up to evil. Um, we're meant to speak out against evil. We're meant to be courageous and, you know, be brave and be bold in that. We're not meant to be Ahab's. We're not meant to just tolerate, um, these evil things going on, um, we're not meant to tolerate it. And it's cowardly um, for someone, um, if a situation of abuse is, is brought to them, it's a lot easier for, think about this, it's a lot easier to place the burden back on the victim and say, you just need to forgive, or you, know, you need to do better, you need to be more loving. That's a lot easier to do than to actually confront an abuser. You know, it, it, it takes um, boldness. It takes courage to confront an abuser. Um, but we're meant to do that as the church. And, you know, I wanted to give another example of that because um, Peter in the New, New Testament um, you know, we're told to forgive, we're told to love, but we're also told to confront and stand up to evil. Um, Acts 5, chapter 1 through 10, um, that's the example of Peter. He confronted Ananias and his wife Sapphira. Sapphira. Um, basically, they held back money and they lied about it and basically stole it from the church. Um, and he, he confronted them to their face and they both dropped down dead. Um, when he did, um, and it says, great fear gripped the entire church and everyone else who heard what had happened. Um, so again, I mean, this, um, it's, it's just a wrong, it's wrong to think as the church that we're meant to just tolerate everything and embrace everything and accept evil that's going on, like we need to stand up and we need to confront it. It's important um, because there's a, there's a lot of things going on right now and there's a lot of people who are hurting. And these people who have been abused, who have ex gone through an experience with a narcissist or an emotional abuser, um, they need to be able to come to the church and, and find healing and find a safe place, and find refuge. That's what we're meant to be. That's what we're meant to be as the church. And they they shouldn't have to go to a secular psychologist. They shouldn't have to go watch New Age videos to try to find out um, how to you know get out of the situation or to find healing. Um, they should be able to find that in the church. They should be able to find that in the church, you know. We should be embracing people like that. We should be um, loving people like that and providing safety um, and standing up for them. 
you know, standing up for them. You know, we don't always think like when we're operating under an Ahab type spirit that is complacent, um, where we don't stand up for ourselves, that 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 actually affects other people. You know, sometimes we think if I don't stand up for myself, it's only affecting me. It's only hurting me. Um, but have you ever thought about how um, by not standing up to these things that you may be hurting other people as well or allowing other people to be hurt as well? So, you know, a, a person shouldn't be able to find more help. A person in an abusive relationship should not find more help in their secular workplace than they do in the church. That's a problem if that's true. And so I think that's enough for today. I mean, I could, this is a, a pretty in-depth subject and there's a lot that can be said about it. But I'll kind of wrap things up, and um, there's just one last thing that I wanted to challenge you with today. Um, where have you been complacent where you need to stand up? Where have you been complacent where you need to stand up? And also, have you thought about how that's impacting others? If you're not standing up, have you thought about how that might impact others? And finally, what are you tolerating that maybe you need to remove from your life? So what have you been tolerating that maybe you know now it's time to remove this thing from your life? Let me know. Leave your comments. And we'll talk later, guys. Bye.